ever since I don't know when I've been drinking bourbon whiskey, scotch and gin. Gonna get high, man. I'm gonna get loose. Need me a triple shot of that. So, uh, Rob it's, like, it's like it's like Simon and Garfunkel. It is a bit, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> what does that make me? <laughs> Art. So, Mr. Wells, for those of you who know him, is a little bit rock and roll. He's not your average music industry executive. So, when we talked about doing this, he pointed out that a lot of people in the industry, when they do a panel or an interview, they don't necessarily actually answer the question correctly. So, Rob came up with a novel suggestion, which was wait, wait, wait. This wasn't my idea. Liz. Uh, yes, it was. <laughs> Rob came up with a novel suggestion that if either of us actually didn't answer a question correctly, be it from the audience or indeed from each other, uh, then we'd have to immediately after this panel session take a shot of Jack Daniels. So we have the shots of Jack Daniels and uh, anyone who wants to watch us drink them later, if we have to drink any of course, uh, we have the bottle of Jack Daniels and we're ready to rock and roll. So I'd just like to say it's great to be here with Rob. For those of you who don't know Rob, basically he's the man. I mean, he runs digital for music, universal group, globally. Last time you were here, it was just international, now it includes the US, yeah? Correct, and Canada, and, uh, and Mexico. That's the, uh, that's the EMI apart. guy trying to make, a, make an exit. And how, how, how are you finding this like, new role? How, uh, how? Yeah, it's good. I've, uh, I've relocated to Los Angeles, uh, been there for six months, so you know, the weather's, that's kind of the quite weather's handy, better than London. quite handy for the kind of going out on the surfboard thing. Which you're I not know the you're first on. person to point that out. Yeah, well, that yeah. was the key ro reason you took the role, I guess. Yeah. Exactly, that yeah. and the uh, opportunities and the challenge. <laughs> so, uh, you know. so do you, um, we've been talking a lot about cloud-based locker services, Google, all of that kind of stuff. How do you see it back at HQ? I mean, what's your... What's your view on the kind of Google coming into the market? And so, um, okay, so from a pragmatic point of view, uh, and uh, as, as the guy who looks after the digital business development for, for Universal, I think you, you have to have two uh, focuses when you're, when you're looking at, uh, at uh, transitioning the, the music yeah. business. You have to think artists, and you have to think consumers. Yeah. If you're camping on rights, uh, and not progressing with your licensing strategy in the correct way, then you should probably be shot and removed. Right. Um, so with, with, with artists in mind, with consumers in mind, cloud-based services are definitely going to be uh, de rigueur uh, moving forward. They're the big thing, yeah? Correct. So are, are there kind of examples that you'd use of stuff that's working? Um, you know, by definition, Spotify is essentially a cloud-based music yeah. service. Uh, the services that we've seen go live uh, in the last uh, few weeks in the U.S., Amazon and Google, are immensely disappointing from a from a from a music industry perspective. Uh, they're not really going to light up or invigorate uh, music consumption in the way that, uh, that that the potential of a cloud-based offer could uh, really do. Uh, there's some exciting things in the pipeline from. Uh, from other partners, yeah, like uh, like uh, like uh, Apple, yeah, uh, which you know Apple Apple are Apple aren't famous for releasing bad products. Yeah, they're quite uh, good at it. Actually, they're good. They? At, they're good at releasing great products. So uh, you know, I think uh, any Apple-based locker stroke cloud service will be something that's going to make the consumers uh, uh, sing. So. so sort of Google. Hold on a second. The rules yeah. of this game were that it was uh, one to one, was it? Oh yeah, that's true. Actually, we're yeah. supposed to be having a conversation. I okay. agree. Put me on the spot. So then. okay, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Sony. Yes. Corporate. I know I said we were going to start with easy questions. Okay, all I right. Lied. Okay, right. Thanks, Rob. So, uh, Sony. <laughs> yep. Have they blown it? So, Sony, I think most people here know that we power Sony service. And clearly, I mean, it's obvious. Everyone knows. It's all over the news. They had a very vicious, sustained attack uh, on their infrastructure. There's no, there's no question about that. And, you know, we integrate fully into their back-end systems. We've seen the security, and it was very, very... You know, it's top-notch security. Um, it's clearly very disappointing they were attacked. It was very clearly bad that they that the service went down. But I believe, ultimately, they're putting a service on 300 million devices over the next three years. They're rolling out all over the world, including here in Asia. Um, they, as you'll know, like even in the very before they'd even launched, they were building up very good subscriber growth. We can see people. The like numbers the service. for the benefit of the audience. The numbers were amazing. So for the first. Five weeks. Five weeks before we had to unfortunately suspend the services. Correct. Yeah. So I believe now they're back in business and now that they can relaunch and now that they've, they've essentially cleared out all of that issue and they've got top-notch security left, right and center, 
that they've got a great opportunity to leverage on those 300 million devices and make a difference with a licensed service for the music industry. I mean, they are Sony Corp. They are the biggest sea vendor. I think what is interesting is that I think Sony is not going to be the last company that comes under this kind of attack. And that is a threat for cloud-based services of whoever it might be. I agree. So the answer to my question, yes. before I reach for a shot glass, <laughs> is no, they haven't blown it. No, they haven't blown it. I mean, uh, for me, it would have been highly disappointing if it had happened in six months when they had millions of subs. Um, actually, it happened early on, before the hard launch. Um, and we've seen consumers love the service. Okay, so, and they are going to continue with the oh, aggressive yeah, marketing 100%. spend. And, okay, great. I mean, as you know, because uh, oh, we've signed you, deals not, with you. I'm not... They this are is for the benefit committed. of the audience. <laughs> as, as you know, because, uh, because we've signed deals with you, they're very committed financially to the music industry, which might bring us on, actually, to the whole... The, if, if Sammy was here sitting opposite, he'd say, the music industry, in order to launch a service, you have to come up with some huge amount of money to persuade anyone to license anything. Is that true? Is that holding services God, back? this really is getting pithy. <laughs> um, no, incorrect. No, no, so you don't need to pr provide advances or guarantees? Like just uh, What's the philosophy? So the philosophy is, you know, if, if we look at any partner that comes into Universal and a partner comes in and says, we want to launch a, a legitimate music offer, yeah. and it depends what they're currently doing. If they're a startup, then the commercial terms will look completely different yeah. to a company like Google or Amazon or yeah. Apple. Yeah. Uh, and, you know... Some of these partners who are trying to move into the music, the, mu the legitimate music space, have an existing problem yeah. in that their networks or products uh, are catalysts for uh, the, the the use of music for non-payment. I won't yeah. use the P word. Yeah. So any commercial conversation with a partner like that will come with a okay, lot of issues. Let's let's there's some baggage. Let's tighten it up. So let's say hypothetically speaking, there was a partner who owned a major video streaming site that occasionally had piracy on it, that might be an issue, for example. Yes, it might be an issue. Almost a shot glass there. But not quite. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a lot of people coming into this space and doing cloud-based services. Well, why, why is it suddenly all happening now? I mean, is it smartphones? Is it yeah, it's just the, the music? just the development of technology. It's you know, I look at, from a personal perspective, I look at the number of machines I have in my household. You know, I have a two-year-old baby who who has his own iPad. You know, he can't Fantastic. he can't speak. He can uh, he can't speak or write, but he's really good at Angry Birds. <laughs> you know, so you know, and, and I, that's one machine. I have an iPad. My wife has an iPad. I have you know laptops for work. I have a home. So it's kind of like and you have a PlayStation Three in the office, which you seem to spend most of your time using. Yeah, I I did. <laughs> <laughs> Pre LA, yeah. <laughs> No, before it all went down, Lewis. <laughs> Whoa, okay, own goal. <laughs> okay, I think that's one shot glass for me. That was good, actually, well done. <laughs> you walked into that, what can I, I say? I walked into it 100%. I think it's my turn, isn't it? Okay, yeah. Um, so what next for Omniphone? You have this great service live with uh, Sony Curiosity. What what next? OEMs or what's well, next? Well, we're we're kind of we 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 clearly are a, a solutions provider. We do the licensing for people like Sony or for anyone who can't manage to get licensing on their own. Um, we also do the technology end to end, the platform, the clients, the servers. I mean, the end to end. Essentially, if you're a big consumer electronics vendor, then we're a place where we can make it happen for you on a global basis. Um, and that can be any kind of service. So, you know, I think it's no secret we're working with a number of other partners, particularly in the handset space. Um, it's no secret, so name them. Okay, that's my second shot glass, isn't Brilliant. it? So I, I'm afraid I can't disclose the name of the major handset vendor who Who's we're gonna win this working game? with. <laughs> I knew it was your idea for a good reason. <laughs> yeah, you're very good at this, aren't you? Normally drinking games, you tend to win. So let's talk about the... Um, Let's talk about the U.S. market. So in the U.S. market, we have, you know, services like Pandora. So, you know, kind of, you don't make very much money off those guys, do you? How do you feel about a service like Pandora? That's a good question. How do I feel about services like Pandora? Uh, I don't like Pandora. Uh, I think Pandora is gaming uh, the DMCA. I think yeah. they've built up a, uh, they've done a great job yeah. of building up a huge subscriber base and not remunerating the rights holders properly. They haven't got a premium service bolted onto their existing service. I think they're actually operating a platform that's very substandard when it yeah. comes to a consumer listening experience. It's very passive, it's very sit back. Uh, I think uh, when other services go live in the US, 
Pandora is ripe for cannibalization. I yeah. think we're going to see huge waves of consumers leaving the Pandora service and moving into other services. Uh, you know, so I, the I, biggest I don't issue see them as a, I don't see them as a business partner. And that's a very important point. Yeah. When, when we have a new service that goes live, we throw stuff at it. Yeah. You know, the Curiosity service, there was, you know, artists exclusives and yeah. performances. And we don't do that with Pandora. Pandora is a passive because they don't have any form of upsell to proper Precisely. subscription services. They're a business partner of money. Sound Exchange. They're not a business partner of Universal. They just pay royalties at a very low rate and keep almost all the cash. Exactly. Yeah. So if you if you if you looked at the climate in the U.S., you've talked about some of the partners who are potentially coming into the U.S. in the near future. So you talked about Apple in particular. Uh, well, no, I, don't oh, it's your question, isn't yeah, before it? Before you ask okay, that, that no, question, I, I just wanted the, to have a second. I get go. the shot. Um, any other services that give you the fear, Omniphone, as as the kind of like you know as a as a as a back end yeah. provider of music uh, of music licenses to big powerful multinationals. Are there any services that are that are bubbling up, whether it's Mog or Audio or Beyond Oblivion? Anything that anything you see as as direct competition to what you have? Well, I think I mean there's clearly competition for every single service that exists today in the world, but the fundamental issue is that. The vast majority of consumers have yet to adopt this stuff. Um, the you know the reality is, I mean, we've done research. I don't know, you've done your own. Sixty percent of users in or consumers in Europe have not even downloaded or played a single digital music track in their lives, which is a scary stat when you consider CD came out and was almost instantly adopted. And I think the reason why I, I don't get concerned is that there's just an enormous market out there, and there's a lot of innovation to take place. And ultimately, the services that succeed will be those with a great user experience. I mean, we talked about Nokia comes with music earlier. You know, one that was a great outing I agree. with a great fanfare. And I know you spoke at length on why it could actually change the game, but the end product wasn't really that great. You probably agree. I agree. It also, I mean, you know, it, it was a great service in that it did light up new markets and new regions for us where we previously had nothing. And it showed the music industry could change and would adopt True. new models, True. which was great because it's led to a lot of these new services that have come out. Correct. But I believe fundamentally, I mean, Sony is a great partner because they're just so massive, so many devices and a great user experience. But the focus for me is we need to roll out services to as many consumers that they love using, that are great to use. Um, and we're still in the very, very early stages of that, albeit I think you'd agree access services are probably the fastest growth of the business today. And True. And Apple, I mean, an interesting question for you now. This is my, this is my first real... Oh, okay. is it my... No, it's, my, it's your turn. Is it my turn? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think it's your turn. So, so I've heard that there's quite a lot of music industry executives going to California the week after next. Would that be because that's the day that Apple are launching their locker service? Now, I'm not going to duck this question because I genuinely don't know the answer. <laughs> well, they haven't invited you. No. <laughs> That'll be Sandy. <laughs> All right. Very good. Very good. 2-1. Um, in car. Yeah. Lots of talk about, you know, the four places where consumers consume music, in the home, in the hand, in the car, and at some people at work. In car, what's going on with Omniphone's plans for in car? It's very exciting. And, yeah. and name some manufacturers you're talking to. Oh dear, you're so naughty. Cheap. <laughs> <laughs> so um, clearly, we work very closely with Grace Snow, our strategic partner, um, who uh, work, as you know, with almost every single automotive player in that in that space. I think the fundamental issue is uh, most people in the U.S. The number one place they listen to music is in the car. Um, and in, in Europe, it's the number two place. The living room is first, and then there's the car. Out here in Asia, it depends on the territory. It's one or it's two. Um, so fundamentally, if we can deliver services straight into the car, where you've got a SIM card embedded in the, in the, in the car, where the head unit just gives you access to all the music in the world, and it synchronizes, as Sandy was saying earlier, with your music on your phone, on your PC, on every way you've got, that's a fantastic user experience. Um, so we're working with Grace Snow and a number of major automotive players uh, to bring those kind of solutions into the vehicles. Um, and I think I've just about squeezed out of I'll a shot glass there. Yeah. Your, your turn. So if you, um, if you actually had to look at um, the, uh, the, uh, the, our friends at Beyond Oblivion, so there's been a lot of talk about them for two, two and a half years. And, you know, it just seems to be a lot of talk. I mean... Have you got a license deal with them? Uh, not yet, but we are in conversation with them. Okay. Well-funded, 
uh, run, well by a, run by run by an ex uh, record producer. You know, they kind of si they seem to have traction in the marketplace. And do you believe in that model? Uh, I believe in enabling as many partners to offer legitimate music services as possible. So, do I believe in the model that they're proposing to us? Yes. Okay. All right. We'll Excellent. leave it at that. Okay. Uh, you got well over I, I have another question here, and it's a one-word question. Vodafone. Yes. Question mark. Okay. So, uh, we work with Vodafone in the UK, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and um, I can, we had a discussions on working with them in, in other markets. So, let me elaborate then. So, yeah. everyone, most people will probably realize or understand why operators move into music set the selling of legitimate music is to acquire customers, reduce churn, potentially drive a bit of ARPU. Well, I Why have none of them got it made right. it work? Okay, so I think uh, this, this is an answer and also a question at the same time, is you know, why has it taken so long for a lot of these cloud-based services to take off? Fundamentally, I believe it's because the mobile handset was, was a closed door for a lot of these services. It wasn't possible for you know, a Sony service or a Spotify service or indeed a Google service to exist on a lot of these devices because the carrier was ability to veto the ability for that to happen. Sure. And clearly, the introduction of smartphones has opened that up through app stores. And I think the lesson that we've learned is that fundamentally, I believe that the industry has been held back by carriers for the last two years. That's a bold statement, Rob. Yeah. And so would you agree with that, Rob? Well... <laughs> <laughs> oh, the return. <laughs> Unfortunately, you can't slag off business partners who pay you large advances, can you? Even if you actually I'm agree. I'm only taking one shot for this question. <laughs> so listen, Rob, we've only got three minutes left, and I know there's a lot of people here in the audience who'd like to try and find a way to get you to, take, to move on from two all. So does anyone here have any questions for our friend Mr. Wells? Fantastic. Well, there we go, over here. <coughs> Sorry, name and, name and position, please. Yeah, but who are you in the darkness? <laughs> oh, hello, Jasper. Um, there's a lot of sectors that are claiming to be the new rock and roll. Rock and roll is the new rock and roll. So, sorry, the question over there. Do we have a microphone? Or do you want to just uh, stand up and shout? Uh, hang on. Come and have a drink. It's got a loud voice. Um, 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 with, with the um, garage band movement, um, that is um, a lot of tools in um, um, consumers' hands, and with the rise of um, uh, independent internet radio, how do you see that affecting uh, the industry um, um, as you see it now? I mean, you, you, sp you spend a lot of time talking about well, what's happening on digital rights and what's happening with the, with the current industry and the distribution of music. Uh, what do you see happening um, in the um, um, in the movement where people are actually empowered to make their own content? Yeah, it's a great question. With people. So, uh, you know, the technology and digital revolution is affecting every single part of the music industry value chain. Uh, my my responsibilities in the world's biggest record company basically focus on enabling as many consumers who want to listen to our music, uh, giving them the chance to listen to our music through various licensing deals. Uh, from an A&R perspective, it's never been kind of uh, the, 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 the change in the A&R process has, has been uh, seismic over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, the fact that more and more consumers now have tools at their disposal at a very low price point in order to record and publish themselves is also a, 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 a seismic shift uh, in the music industry. Uh, I think... You know, one of the things that was mentioned yesterday at lunch, which is a kind of a three to four year old viewpoint, is that, uh, you know, with all of this new kind of uh, technology at the disposal of songwriters and, and consumers in the home, the end of the record company is nigh. Well, you know, that's kind of, I think a lot of people have backed down from that because, you know, if that was true, then there'd be a legion of new uh, unsigned artists parading around the world selling millions of records, which hasn't been the case. Um, in fact, in markets like Spain, uh, where the music industry is literally on its knees through piracy, we've seen none of this, uh, you know, glut of new uh, new material, new artists. Uh, and in fact, the opposite has been true. Last year, I think, in the top 50 best-selling records albums in Spain, there weren't any new artists. So it's it's great, uh, and it's also it's great to see more and more people, you know, 
performing and, and producing and songwriting and, and, and experimenting with music, but that's going to feed into the existing infrastructure, whether that's independents or majors, because on a global basis, that's what the industry needs. Okay, we're about to run out of time, so I've just got one more question for you, Rob, to see if we can... If we're out of time. <laughs> so this time next year, when we're standing here... Sitting here. Do, or sitting here, yeah. rather. Do you think, by this is your prediction moment, do you think at that point Amazon and Google will be licensed? I think at that point we will see legitimate licensed locker services from both Amazon and Google, yes. Okay, that's a prediction. Let's see. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Rob. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>